Happy spring. I hope you are having a good spring day, even if it is a bit dreary outside. Uh, my highlight already this Monday is that I saw my first Oriole of the season. So I think I'm going to have a pretty good week. Um, but I just want to thank uh, Katie and Kitty and the Erie County University Express program for inviting me back this semester. These are some of my favorite presentations to give. We always have a great group of folks joining us with lots of expertise to share themselves. And yes, um, if you are wondering why my name looks familiar, I have presented before in my previous position with Cornell Cooperative Extension. In the past, we've talked about seeds and urban agriculture, and those recordings are also up on the Erie County YouTube page that Kitty mentioned. Um, but today we're going to talk about how to have success with seeds, uh, as well as seedlings or starts or transplants, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it is May, after all, and we're probably starting to phase out of indoor seed production and into transplanting and even direct seeding things. So we'll touch uh, a bit on all of this. And I do suspect we might have some experienced gardeners joining us today. And although I'm the one presenting, I would love if you all would share resources and advice with all of us. So there will be a few times where we pause and you can do some sharing in the chat box. Um, I very much welcome that. Uh, we are all learning after all. And uh, most of the pictures I'm sharing with you today are from my own gardens in the past. And you'll see firsthand that there are times when I haven't followed some of the advice I'm going to share with you today, where you know, maybe I haven't thinned plants when I should have or provided enough light. But as I said, we're all learning together. Um, and so I'm happy that you're spending some of your time learning with us this morning. So, as Kitty mentioned, I work for Rodale Institute, which is based out of Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Um, you might be familiar with Rodale. We put on a lot of workshops for gardeners and farmers throughout the summer. You might be familiar with our publishing company. I don't know if you can see that, but there are a lot of gardening related resources that have put, been put out over the years by the Rodale Press. Um, but we are a nonprofit organization that was founded back in 1940, and we've been dedicated to organic production um, since then. And we support gardeners and farmers through research and education and technical, technical assistance. Um, because at the end of the day, we're really super motivated to just get people thinking about this connection between healthy soils, healthy food, and healthy people. And then back in 2019, uh, Rodale started a consulting program so that we can help farmers uh, transition to certified organic production. And our team of consultants is spread across the country. I'm located here in the South Towns in Erie County, but I work across the state of New York, as well as the surrounding region. And we help all types of farmers fruit, dairy, vegetable, livestock, hay, um, you name it, we help them. So if you know a farmer that might be interested in working with us, uh, please feel free to connect them. I will have my contact information at the end of this presentation. So before we jump in, I told you I'd give you a, a, a chance to share things in the chat. I would love to know what you all are most excited to grow this season. Um, I'll give everyone a minute or two to type in the chat box um, new varieties, new crops that they're growing and looking forward to growing this year. So do entertain me and put them in the chat box. <laughs> Butterfly attractors. Yes. Tomatoes and herbs. Anything else? I know I'm personally looking forward to planting out um, some snapdragons and sweet peas this year. I've started uh, some new flowers indoors that I've never grown before. 
Always looking for new lettuces to try. Different kinds of basil. Yes. Container veggie garden. Anything else anyone would like to add? We are also growing a new tomato variety called Tiny Tim. It is a dwarf tomato variety. We are growing it purely for entertainment. So we'll see how that goes. Wild flocks, amazing. Well, thank you all. Feel free to keep throwing stuff in the chat. I'm sure everyone else is interested as well. So we're gonna spend our time together talking about a lot of different things related to seeds and seedlings. Um, I won't go through this list because we'll, we'll touch on this throughout the presentation. So um, seeds or seedlings, start indoors or buy them. Which one should you do? For me, I always do a bit of both. Uh, you know, seeds are just a lot of fun. Um, it's fun to browse through catalogs in the winter, give yourself something to tide you over during those snowy days. And there are so many more varieties to choose from. And I think that this is also a more economical way to go uh, because seed packets only cost a couple of bucks for maybe 25 to up to 200 seeds, depending on the crop. However, this is more involved, right? Because you will need an adequate seed starting setup that we are going to talk about. It also requires knowledge of special requirements that seeds might have for germination. And it also takes more time. You know, you might be starting seeds in late February, early March, depending on what the seed is, and be tending to them all the way up until late May. So that's a lot of time and care. And uh, with seedlings, on the other hand, if you're buying them from a nursery or, or going to a, a seedling swap, this is a great option because greenhouses and nurseries typically have, you know, high quality seedlings to choose from, um, but they are going to be more expensive. There also tend to be less options as far as varieties go at the greenhouse. Uh, but transplants are great if you don't have the time or space to start seeds indoors, uh, or maybe you're just running late on the whole garden planning and you just want to just go pick some stuff up and throw it in the garden that weekend. Um, like I said, I tend to do a bit of both. Without a doubt, there are always going to be seeds that I plant indoors that just, they fail because they're um, old and they didn't have great germination, or they simply aren't as healthy as I'd like by the time I want to plant them outside. So inevitably, I always end up doing a bit of both. When should you start seedlings indoors? Uh, I do recommend following the directions on your seed packets. That's a safe place to start. Um, you'll find that most seeds, or well, some seeds rather, should be started indoors at least 10 weeks or more before last frost. Um, these tend to be some flower varieties, um, some herbs, but most annual vegetable crops are going to require um, that you start them around six to eight weeks before the last frost. Now, depending on your setup indoors, the age of your seeds, uh, and your personal experiences, you may find that you need to start things a tad bit earlier, you know, perhaps to account for slow germination. But I do want to caution you though, because starting seeds way too early may result in leggy seedlings. Um, you might have problems with plants growing too big and becoming root bound. They'll likely experience more transplant shock as a result. And then of course, the earlier you start, the more potting up you're going to have to do to keep everyone happy. So do pay attention to your last frost date. Um, here in Erie County, our hardiness zones range from 5A to 6A, depending on whether you're in the South Towns um, with me, or if you're deeper into the hills or closer to the lake. Our first frost, um, as you all probably know, can happen anywhere from October 1st to October 1st, but it's the last frost that we wanna pay attention to with seed starting. And that could be um, anywhere from May 21st to June 11th. So 
we're probably going to be starting many of our seeds in late March to mid April based on these dates. Where is best? Um, well, my question to you would be, what do you have to work with? Um, you know, shelving in a spare room or a space in your basement will work. That's what we do in my house. Uh, if you have your own greenhouse, even better. Window sills are unfortunately not optimal, but if it's all you have to work with, um, do prioritize your south facing windows um, to maximize light and you should still try to su provide supplemental lighting. But generally um, you want to avoid rooms with lots of foot traffic, um, you know, animals, kids running around, grandkids running around. Um, you want to avoid rooms that experience cold drafts or even excessive heat. And uh, keep in mind that when you're starting seeds and potting up and watering, you might have water or soil spills happen on occasion. Maybe that's just in my house, um, but you do want to find a space where you're okay um, if that happens or you can clean it up easily. And keep in mind, again, that even though your seeds may not take up very much room early on, you are going to need to pot them up eventually, and then they'll require even more room. Now, when it comes to germination, uh, seeds require some pretty basic things for that magic to happen. A proper temperature is key. Um, air, or rather oxygen, is required, and water is required. Uh, believe it or not, light is optional for many seeds when it comes to germination. Some seeds do require light, but many do not. Um, and then some seeds also require a few other special techniques or bits of knowledge for optimal germination. So let's run through some of those. Scarification is one. This is the process of breaking seed dormancy by scratching, nicking, or softening the seed coat. And you'll find that many hard seeds like um, legumes, um, okra, many trees, nasturtiums, a lot of perennials, they require that you break seed dormancy through scarification. And you can do this with <clears throat> a file or a knife, sometimes hot water. It, it depends on the seed we're talking about, of course. And uh, so here on the left is an example of a nasturtium seed that I've lightly filed in one section with uh, a dedicated file. I don't know um, if you can see my mouse, but on the bottom left, you have this lighter um, tan um, outside of the seed. And then here is where I've actually filed the seed coat a little bit to break through. You don't need to file the entire seed. That would take too much time. Um, you just want it to file it enough so that the water can more easily penetrate in through the seed coat. Another technique is stratification. This is the process of breaking seed dormancy by mimicking natural conditions. Uh, again, required by many perennials, many tree species. Uh, depending on the plant, it may be chilling that you want to mimic, or it may be warming that you want to mimic. Uh, fortunately, either way, this can be done inside with some strategic planning. Uh, generally, you would place your seeds inside um, some moist peat moss inside of a plastic bag and then place that bag inside a refrigerator for a period of time. If you're wanting to mimic chilling or if you want to mimic warming, you might place it on top of the refrigerator or in some other area that's um, slightly warm. And on the right side, you'll see some uh, milkweed that I ordered this year. Note that on the seed packet, not only does it say cold stratification is required, um, but that you should cover and refrigerate for three to four weeks. That's how you can do it indoors. And uh, I always like to see what I can get away with with seeds. And I played around with not stratifying some milkweed just for kicks. And out of 10 seeds that I planted, only one germinated. So if stratification is required, 
do it. <laughs> it's, you're going to be much happier with the end result. Some seeds will also benefit from soaking, um, particularly medium to large seeds with thick seed coats. Uh, this will help speed up germination. And so you might try this for peas, beans, Swiss chard, uh, beets. Optimal soaking length probably varies from seed to seed, but generally you don't want to soak longer than overnight, um, so do plan accordingly. Heat is another useful tool for germination. Um, we'll talk about temperature in a few slides, but some um, heat-loving crops like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants actually benefit from slightly warmer temperatures. So 75 to 80 degrees is optimal for them, and you can achieve that um, by using a heat mat, which again, we'll touch on. And then light. Uh, so yes, light is optional, but some seeds require light exposure to germinate. Most of these are going to be smaller seeded crops like lettuces and poppies and carrots and dill. And you'll notice on their seed packets that the instructions say to um, just gently press them into the soil or lightly rake them in. And this is because they need light exposure for germination. So you can't bury them too deeply or they won't germinate. Uh, if, like me, you hoard seeds, you may end up trying to plant seeds that are a few years old. Um, and especially for seed that you're saving, it's always important to test their germination um, because germination does decrease over time as seeds age or if we store them in less than ideal conditions. So doing a quick germination test will help guide our seeding rates. And this process is simple enough. Uh, take 10 seeds of, of your, your crop and place them on a moist paper towel. And then you roll that paper towel up, place it in a plastic bag, label that bag with the date, variety, age of seeds, other helpful information, and then go ahead and place that bag in a warm area and wait a few days. Uh, this next step is critical. Do not forget. Don't forget about your seeds. Um, <clears throat> personal experience again. Um, but after a few days, or however long it typically takes for that crop to germinate, open up your paper towel and count how many seeds have germinated. If eight out of 10 have germinated, your germination rate is 80%. If it's five out of 10, then it's 50%. And so now you know how many seeds you might need to plant in a container in order to get um, the number of plants that you're looking for. So, if your germination rate is 50%, then maybe you plant two seeds per container. And on the right here, you can see a picture of some Jing okra that we saved back in, I think it was 2016 that we saved it, but we wanted to plant it out in 2017. And so we just did a quick germination test in some extra soil we had lying around, and we ended up with nine out of 10 seeds germinating, which isn't too bad. Now, as nice as it would be to start everything indoors to get a jump on the season, there are some seeds that just really should not be planted inside. And root crops are a big one. Um, we eat these crops for their roots. <laughs> so as such, root development is critical. And if we're growing these plants in space limited cells or containers and then transplanting them into the ground, we're introducing a lot of opportunity for their roots to become damaged, and that might result in deformed carrot formation or no root formation um, at all. The other um, trait of plants that uh, I advise not to start inside is if they're very fast growing. <laughs> Beans, peas, legumes, they grow quickly, probably should not be started indoors. Same with corn and cucurbits, um, so our cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, 
I am, I have mixed feelings on this. Um, there can be times when it's adv advantageous to start them indoors, particularly if you have pest issues or disease issues that you're trying to um, avoid during the season. It might be uh, advantageous to plant out transplants so that those plants have um, a, a head start against pests. But if you are seeding them indoors, they really shouldn't be inside for very long because they do grow quickly. They can get root bound very easily. I have seen people start all of these things inside, so it can be done. Um, and I'm curious, we'll pause here for a second, if you all have started any of these things inside and have had success with starting these crops inside, um, or if there are other things that you know, you've learned that shouldn't traditionally be started indoors, but you've gotten away with it. Any experiences or stories to to share? Um, I would welcome those in the chat box. Now, always put them directly in the soil. I started all my seedlings last Monday. I haven't had anything pop up yet. I will say as backyard gardeners, we should probably follow these rules and not start them indoors. Um, but many farmers that I've worked with in the past have started some of these crops inside um, because they have dedicated greenhouses for these crops. They have lots of labor involved that are keeping an eye on them and getting them outside. They have protection for them outside if they have to get them in the ground a little too early. Uh, but in general, I think we should probably avoid um, starting these crops indoors. What is better, a three season room or a basement? That was a prior question. Um, three season room or a basement? Uh, I would say it really depends. Um, the questions I would wonder about are how cold does the three season room get versus the basement? Um, what does lighting look like? What does airflow look like? We, let's revisit this question at the end as we walk through some of the optimal um, conditions for starting seeds indoors, and maybe we'll, we'll have a decision at the end on what makes most sense for this person. What should you start your seeds in? There are no rules, people. <laughs> Get creative. Um, you could use peat pots or cow pots. Uh, yogurt cups, plastic cells. When I'm talking about plastic cells, I'm referring to these like black plastic cells in the upper right here. You can make newspaper pots. You could use plastic takeout containers. I've done that. Um, there might be pros and cons um, for each, you know, for plastic cells or plastic containers in general. Um, if you handle them carefully, they can be reused for many years and they could be in a, make for an efficient use of space if they're all the same size, uh, but really they should be cleaned and sanitized before reuse, and this can be time consuming, especially if you don't do it, you know, in the fall and you have to wait to plant um, uh, so that you can clean out all of your pots. Another option is peat pots, like in the, the left there. These are nice because you could plant the entire pot they are biodegradable. Um, you do want to pay attention to um, you know, rip or cut out the bottom so that the roots can actually grow out of the pot when you plant them in the ground. In my experience, I found that peat pots either retain too much moisture and get a lot of algae growth on top, or they dry out too easily. It's a bit ironic that I've experienced both, but another option that I see people go for is egg cartons. Um, these are eco-friendly, of course, um, but starting seeds in egg cartons is not optimal. You know, most seedlings aren't going to have much soil to grow in. Uh, they're certainly not suitable for deep-rooted or fast-growing plants, and they might not decompose as quickly as you'd think once they're in the garden. Any um, inventive, creative containers that folks have started seeds in? Please go ahead and share those in the chat. Has anyone used milk jugs? That's something I've never tried myself, but I see a lot of people doing winter sewing in milk jugs outside. Feel free to throw that in the chat, but we'll keep moving along. 
Soil blocking is a fun way to, uh, to plant that reduces the use of plastic materials. Uh, these are metal hand tools that uh, essentially press the soil into a cube. Here on, in the picture on the top left, you can barely make out like a small little divot where you can easily just plant your seed. Uh, this is a great way to start seeds because it allows for natural air pruning of the roots. Um, they come in multiple sizes, so you might use something larger like this for tomatoes, eggplant, whereas these smaller soil blocks um, might be better suited for lettuces, um, maybe some herbs. And uh, if you are soil blocking, most likely you'll have to make up your own seed starting mix because um, the recipe is very important. Um, you want a fine material. You don't want something with a lot of like wood chips in it because uh, that could <laughs> lead to um, improper block formation and moisture is key here. You don't want it to be too soupy, but you do need moisture so the blocks hold together. Um, using these is rather simple. I've enjoyed soil blocking in the past. Um, you essentially just make up your tub of mix and you press your soil blocker into the mix um, to, to fill up the cubes. And, um, and then once they're filled, you go to your container, whatever you're planting them into, maybe if it's a black plastic tray, and you press down while lifting up on the, on the block and out pops cute little soil blocks. So regardless, um, when you go to choose a container, ask yourself a few questions. First, what do you have on hand? Um, I'm a big fan of getting creative. You do not need to spend a lot of money to start seeds. How much space do you have? How many seeds are you starting? How durable are your containers? If you're starting in newspaper pots, how long are those pots going to hold up? What are you planting into them? How long are they going to be inside? How are you watering them so that the newspaper holds up over time? Um, whatever you choose, your containers absolutely need drainage. Now, when it comes to seed starting mixes, um, you do want something that is referred to as a seed starting mix, not a potting mix or potting soil. Seed starting mixes are often um, actually soilless, um, so they don't actually contain soil. They contain often lighter, finer materials like vermiculite and perlite, um, peat moss or coconut coir that hold moisture but allow for um, easy, delicate roots to grow. And the biggest way they differ from your standard potting mix is that potting mix contains similar ingredients, plus maybe compost, field soil, maybe composted manure, uh, fertilizers. You'll find that the majority of seed starting mixes don't actually contain fertilizers. Uh, and then again, if you are choosing to soil block, you will likely need to make up your own seed starting mix. And again, plenty of recipes out there to, to follow. Seeding depth, um, this is another one of those it depends kinds, uh, kind of topics. Uh, but yes, seed to soil contact is critical. It just really depends on the seed. Larger seeds will require more contact with the soil because there's more seed there. It needs more contact with the soil for more contact with moisture. Um, peas, cucumbers, corn, other large seeds are generally planted one inch uh, deep, if not deeper, whereas your smaller seeds like dill, carrot, lettuce um, should only just be lightly pressed into the soil or raked in. A general rule of thumb is to plant seeds at a depth that is twice their width. Lighting makes all the difference for the purposes of germination. As we already talked about, many seeds do not require light, but once they've germinated, they do. Absolutely. So even though you could start some seeds in the dark, it's probably best to go ahead and put a light on them um, for when they pop up through the soil. And uh, again, the light filtering through our windows, it's often not going to be enough for plants even if they're in a south-facing window, you do want supplemental lighting. And 
one of the biggest ways to know if your plants aren't getting enough light is that they're tall or lanky. Um, in a windowsill, you might see them start to reach like curve towards the window. Um, that's not a good sign. So most plants without sufficient light will develop slower, of course, or they'll develop weaker root systems. They might have a harder time um, being transplanted. So if we're going to provide plants with supplemental light, we really need to opt for a source that provides a balance of blue and red um, wavelengths. And this is because um, plants primarily absorb blue and red light. Blue light stimulates strong, healthy stem and leaf development. Uh, when you're shopping around, blue lights might be advertised as grow lights or veg lights um, for vegetative. Uh, whereas the red light is required for flower and fruit development, and they are often advertised as bloom. You can see here on the left a picture of one of the lights that we have in our basement. Um, and you can see actually that the lights are different colors themselves. So the orangier lights are those red lights that are putting off that red light that the, the plants need, whereas the lighter ones are, the, are providing the blue light. You can use fluorescent shop lights, of course. These would work just fine. Um, LEDs are another option. They're typically more efficient, but you do have a higher cost up front. And when you're shopping for fluorescent lights, you'll see that there are many types of bulbs out there from T5 to T8 to T12. And what you wanna look for um, are the T5s or T12s. Um, that are wide spectrum because these are, are they're called grow lights. And they provide that balance of red and blue light. Um, so as you're shopping, again, full spectrum, broad spectrum, these lighting sources are going to be the closest you can get to natural sunlight. Uh, but as you're thinking about lighting, you certainly need to consider how you're going to hang them up <laughs> if you need to hang them up. If you have multiple shelves, you're going to need lighting for each of those shelves. And um, I guess one last lighting tip would be you should leave them on for around 12 to 16 hours a day. Uh, most annual flowers and vegetables will thank you for that. Uh, but do invest in a plant timer to save yourself time turning those lights on and off. Temperature is also critical and optimum temperature for germination also guess what? Depends on the seed that we're talking about. Uh, generally, 70 to 80 degrees is optimum for most crops. You can search optimum seed germination temperatures online and find a plethora of resources. Uh, one tool you might find handy is a heat mat. That's what this is in the bottom right corner. You um, essentially plug it in into an outlet, um, and set the mat underneath your seedling tray and it gently warms the container and the soil. And this can increase soil temperatures by up to 10 degrees, which uh, again is helpful for those, some of those heat loving plants. Understanding the appropriate amount of water to give young seedlings is an important skill. It's very easy to over or under water. And if you have inconsistent or not enough moisture, you may end up with spotty germination or none at all. Uh, if plants are thirsty, you'll notice them begin to wilt. And if they go too long without water, they may actually die. Uh, on the other hand, if you give seedlings too much moisture, young plant roots may lack oxygen. You may begin to see issues with algae buildup, with fungus gnats mold growth. Um, so some general tips here are check soil moisture at least once a day early on. Now once you've potted your seedlings up and you're hardening them off, you're bringing them inside, outside, inside, outside, you probably need to check moisture at least twice a day. And uh, a general rule again is to um, let the very top of the soil surface dry a bit before watering. And I think also in general, bottom watering is preferable to overhead watering. So this allows plants to take up as much moisture as they need 
And it also, of course, minimizes water on plant leaves, which is a good rule in general for avoiding um, disease issues. And um, I guess with that, the only other thing I would mention is that if you are bottom watering, once those plants have drank up as much as they want, do empty out the water. You do not want to let this water uh, sit over time. Fertilizing. Seeds do not require fertilizer to germinate, and this is why most seed starting mixes do not contain any fertility, uh, but once they've germinated, uh, they will benefit from some fertilizer. So you should plan on using a water soluble all purpose fertilizer at quarter strength. Really want to emphasize that quarter strength. They do not need full strength fertilizer um, early on. And fertilizing once a week is probably a good idea. Um, again, just make sure you're avoiding full strength fertility because that can cause salt buildup or nutrient burn um, for your young seedlings. Humidity plays a role in germination as well. Uh, since seeds require moisture and warmth, increased humidity can help soils and seeds stay moist and warm. Uh, you can purchase plastic domes like the one in the picture here. Uh, they come in different sizes, so this is a shorter dome, but they can, they can be pretty tall as well if you have taller um, seeds that you're starting. Uh, sometimes we've also used the plastic containers that leaf uh, mix comes in as mini greenhouses, that would work just fine. If you do purchase domes, I recommend finding ones that have openings like this in the middle here, uh, because as moisture builds up on the inside, you can open it all the way or crack it um, to, to add air circulation um, underneath that dome. You could also use plastic wrap, um, but once your seeds have germinated, absolutely, you definitely want to remove the domes or plastic wrap. They just don't need it at this point. One random pro tip I wanted to share with you all, and it might seem like a random place to put this in the presentation, but succession sowing can be super beneficial um, for backyard gardeners. This refers to spacing out or staggering your plantings of any one crop. And, and so think about the types of crops that you harvest entirely on a regular basis, maybe like head lettuce. Do you need 30 heads of lettuce all at once? Probably not. Perhaps you can stagger your plantings. So you plant 10 heads of lettuce in week one, 10 in week two, and 10 in week three. And so this ensures you have a continuous harvest um, Furthermore, you're also being more efficient with your space indoors. You're minimizing food waste because you're able to consume those heads of lettuce before, you know, maybe they bolt. And we like to do um, succession planting where we start our cold, uh, for cold hardy lettuce varieties early on. Um, we might plant them over a couple of weeks, and then we follow with our heat tolerant lettuce varieties so that by the time we've eaten all of the cold hardy crops, we'll have young heat tolerant uh, lettuces coming down the line for when it warms up. Uh, succession sowing could make sense for many types of greens, uh, cucumbers, squash, zucchini. For longer season crops like tomatoes and peppers, a single sowing is going to be the better route to take. Thinning, um, you've probably noticed by now that um, I have not always done a great job thinning my seedlings, but they do require room to grow, even if they're small. And if you have three or four plants in a tiny little cell, they're all going to suffer, unfortunately. So thinning should be done when seedlings have developed a set of true leaves. And I recommend taking a small pair of scissors and clipping the seedlings at the soil line. How do you know which seedlings you don't want? When I'm thinning um, or attempting to thin, <laughs> some of the things that I look for are plants that appear healthier than others. Do they have more leaves? Do they have thicker stems? Um, opt for those and remove the others. 
You generally want to avoid pulling the seedlings out um, because this could disturb the root systems. And pro tip, if you are thinning out um, like lettuces or herbs, now you have microgreens that you can sprinkle on your eggs or your pizza. There's absolutely no reason why those seedlings need to go to waste. There are a few um, pest management disease concerns when it comes to indoor production. None of them really spell disaster for your young seedlings unless they get wildly out of control. The first issue you might run into is the development of tiny black flying insects around your soil. These are fungus gnats, and uh, as their name implies, they feed off of fungi and organic matter in the soil, but they can also chew on young roots as well. They thrive in moist soils, and because they're poor flyers, you're mostly going to see them in and around your seedling trays or pots. And the best way to manage them is to make your containers an inhospitable place for them to be. And so that means paying attention to watering, reducing the frequency of watering, watering from the bottom so that the top layer of the soil stays dry. This is where the adult fungus gnats lay their eggs. And if it's dry, it's not gonna be optimum for their development. You could also use a well-draining seeding mix. And uh, these yellow sticky traps are super helpful for capturing adults and minimizing um, reproduction. <clears throat> Another issue you might encounter is uh, that seedlings just suddenly wither away overnight. You might notice that maybe their leaves look healthy, but their stems are girdled and they just kind of like fall over and die. And this is due to a disease complex um, of bacteria and fungi. It's referred to as damping off. And so again, to manage this, we need to manage the environment. We need to manage moisture. So reducing the watering frequency, improving air circulation so that soils dry, thinning so that you have improved air circulation, uh, reducing humidity, all of these things will help to, um, to with, with the issue of damping off. And then the last issue, it isn't a pest or disease, but if you find a green mold-like growth on the top of your soil, it's very likely algae. Algae isn't going to be harmful to your seedlings, um, but it is indicative of something that you should be concerned about, which, surprise, surprise, is excessive moisture. Um, so if you see algae growth, cut back on the frequency of watering, increase ventilation, um, and then a pro tip here I'll share with you is if you are reusing containers, do yourself a huge favor, clean them out with soap and water, preferably at the end of the season so that they're ready to go in the spring, and then follow them with a dilute rinse or soak in bleach that, um, in a bleach solution that will help to eliminate any plant pathogens that might persist in soil uh, hanging around in those containers. Um, here are some other things I found helpful over the years. A thermometer, humidity meter, of course, a timer. The small fan is great for improving air circulation and strengthening plant stems over time. A uh, heat mat, of course, a hand sower. That's what this little green thing is in the back there. That's great if you're planting very teeny tiny seeds and you want to be more precise about how many you're planting in, in a container. Uh, shelving is, um, of course, great for maximizing space, domes. Uh, let's take a minute here. Are there other tools or equipment that folks have used and found super helpful in their seed starting setups? Just throw them in the chat. There's got to be something someone uses that I've never thought of. Well, 
feel free to throw it in the chat. Neem oil. Oh, let's, I will revisit the neem oil question at the, um, oh, no, I guess I'll mention it now. Um, I, I would say using neem oil on seedlings to get rid of bugs. Um, it might be a bit much early on. It really depends on um, how old the seedlings are and how dilute, if you've made like a dilute neem oil mixture. I'm sorry, Linda, I would say it depends on the situation here. And of course, what bugs you're trying to get rid of, because neem oil will be more effective for preventing some pest problems than others. Pat says, keeping a diary, diary of what I did. Pat, that is amazing. That is such a useful tool. Um, I do not do a great job at that myself, but super helpful for looking back and seeing which varieties thrived or when you watered or what pest issues you've had. Um, great suggestion. Okay, potting up. Um, at some point in your indoor production, your young seedlings do need to be moved up into new homes. When this happens, depends on the plant we're talking about, how quickly it's growing, what size of container it's currently in. Um, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, um, probably uh, your brassicas as well are likely going to need to be potted up before, at least once, before they're planted outside. Um, pro tip, um, you can uh, bury those plants a little bit deeper, those tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Um, you can bury them a little bit deeper in your pots when you pot them up. They will tolerate it. They will grow additional roots. Um, you can also do that, of course, when you move them outside into the garden. Shopping at the nursery or a seedling swap. There are a few things you need to look for. In general, do plants appear well cared for? Are there signs of insects or diseases? They do happen in the greenhouse and you definitely want to avoid bringing home aphids or white flies or thrips. Do they appear nutrient deficient is something else to look for. Uh, you might remove a transplant or two from its containers, gently of course, and um, see what the roots look like. Are they healthy and white? Are they like a dark brown and starting to decay? Um, and then as hard as it is to do, avoid buying transplants that are in full bloom. And especially if they're already setting fruit, I often see people get really excited about a foot tall tomato that's already setting fruit and they're super excited that they're gonna get an early harvest. But the reality is you don't want your transplants to be putting their energy into flowering or fruiting when one, they're not even in your garden yet. And two, their root systems aren't well established. And quite frankly, it's more than likely that fruit's going to drop off or not uh, form properly um, at transplant time just due to transplant shock. So opt for plants that aren't quite blooming yet or pinch the flowers off at transplant. If you're buying hanging baskets, flowers and hanging baskets, and they're gonna stay there their, their whole lives, you know, you can ignore this piece of advice really concerned here about things that you are planting into a container or into a raised bed. Grafted plants, um, I'm going to skip this, but we can revisit if you all have questions about it. Hardening off is an important step, um, mostly because our young seedlings have experienced fairly consistent temperatures and humidity, likely lower than optimal lighting, and they need time to adapt to the outdoors. So the hardening off process should take one to two weeks, depending on the type of plant we're talking about. Your colder um, tolerant plants, you can probably err on the one week side of that spectrum. Your warmer season crops like eggplant, tomatoes, probably need that full two weeks. This is and should be a gradual process. Uh, we typically start bringing cooler season veggies out, um, perhaps some uh, cold tolerant flowers when it's mid to high 40s and we'll bring them out for a couple of hours, first on cloudier days and then over time 
work their way up to um, longer time outside, more light exposure. Of course, in between, we're bringing them in and out. It's it's just that time of year when we're doing the transplant shuffle. Um, when they are outside, you do want to shield them from harsh sunlight to avoid sunburn, um, harsh temperatures, of course, strong winds, so that um, you you don't see any stems snapping. And animals too. I have to protect my my transplants from my cats. I don't know what it is, but they love my blazing star uh, transplants right now. So, and then keep in mind that um, because they are being moved inside and outside, uh, they may need more frequent watering if they're drying out um, from more exposure to wind and higher temperatures and sunlight outside. Some transplant tips again, number 1, be sure that they've hardened off. If you weren't able to harden the plants off as long as you'd like, um, know that you might see some transplant shock in the weeks after, but more than likely they'll recover. Ideally, your plants should be well watered and recently fertilized. Uh, the best days for transplanting are cloudy overcast days. Even drizzly is great. If sun is in the forecast for the future, uh, the second best option would be to plant them later in the day when the sun has begun to set. Um, and if you can, in the days after transplanting, try to shield them a little bit or dilute, if you can, the sunlight that's hitting them so that they don't get sunburnt. And then if you are transplanting root bound plants, they may benefit from gently like massaging or teasing the roots out so that they'll spread out once they're in their final place. One of the first things I learned when I moved up to Western New York is that you should play it safe and just wait to plant your summer annuals until after Memorial Day. Uh, if you can't wait and frost is imminent, um, you can protect tender transplants by bringing them inside if they're in um, manageable containers, or if they're already in the ground, you can use row cover or light blankets. I've purchased um, some dedicated bed sheets from thrift stores that I use to protect my transplants. And uh, but but be sure to remove those sheets as soon as the sun is up and the air starts to warm, so that you can avoid condensation buildup and get that air around the plants warming up again. Direct seeding outdoors, for the most part, the same principles apply. Um, the only other thing I would add here is that it's really great to start with a level weed free soil. And when you are watering your seeds in, um, use a watering can or the shower setting on your wand. Um, that attached to your hose. You really don't want too um, much like harsh soil splash because that might dislodge the seed or even bury it too deep. And um, sorry, I'm just going to keep breezing through here because I know we're short on time. One last pro tip I'll share with you. If you are growing legumes you and you've never grown legumes before in a particular bed or in the ground, you might benefit from purchasing some inoculant. This is healthy bacteria that forms a relationship with legume plants. Um, the rhizobacteria are actually the ones that take nitrogen from our atmosphere and fix it into a form of nitrogen that plants can use. Um, so if you've grown legumes for many years, you probably already have a healthy population of this bacteria. Um, if not, you might consider purchasing some inoculant this year. Okay, we're wrapping up. Just a few resources to share with you. Um, the first, Rodale does partner with R Joe Lample of Joe Gardner to put on a few backyard courses for backyard gardeners, or sorry, virtual courses for backyard gardeners. Um, and you can find this course and others on our website. Uh, the second thing, I noticed there is a garden swap this Saturday, May 7th at Grassroots Gardens of Western New York, and it looks like folks are invited to swap extra gardening supplies, plants, and seeds. And then something we didn't touch on is what you should be planting 
right now, indoors and outdoors. I love sharing regionally specific information. Fruition Seeds is a Western New York um, or, uh, organic seed company in the Finger Lakes, and they put out this very helpful plant now resource on, I believe, a weekly basis. So you can um, view these updates on their website or on their social media. I always like to use these as guides um, for what I should be seeding indoors and outdoors. And they do also mention things that we should resist sowing a little bit longer. Finally, um, an open invitation to you all for my next presentation on Monday, June 6th. We're going to be talking about Organic Food 101. Uh, that is what organic means. What do farmers have to do to become certified organic? How is organic farming beneficial to the soil, our environment, and our own health? And most importantly, how can you support organic agriculture in New York? With that, that's all my time today and maybe then some. So thank you all for sticking around. Um, if you do have questions, um, I'm happy to stick around and answer some of those questions. And uh, if you have additional resources that you'd like to share, do go ahead and drop those in the chat box as well. With that, just thank you all. All right, wonderful, Caitlin. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as Caitlin said, be sure to tune into her next class in June. And don't forget to check your schedules. University Express is in full throttle. And we have both virtual and in-person classes starting this week and running through mid-July. So we hope to see you virtually as well as in person. If anyone does have a question for Caitlin, we can stay on here a little bit longer and uh, feel free to ask it. Okay, I do see a question. What is the best way to keep bunnies away from lettuce and yes. peas? Actually, uh, I had that question too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have this uh, problem as well. Fencing is probably the best way to, to keep them away. Um, there's some pretty low cost fencing options out there, but you whatever fencing you decide on, it needs to be um, a small enough gauge that the, you know, the bunnies can't hop right through. Um, short of that, that I, I think that's really the safest way to keep them out of, of your lettuce and peas. If anyone is still on the on, on the call that has advice to share, I would welcome any additional tips. How high would you have the fence? Um, well, I guess my next question would be, are we trying to keep out other things as well that might jump the fence? Mm, <laughs> like, right, if we're like keeping deer. out deer, <laughs> if we're keeping, yeah, if we're also keeping out deer, then you probably want to go for a taller fence. Um, I've seen deer fence as tall as, you know, 10 feet uh, for, for bunnies. I would say maybe 3 to 4 feet might be safe. I've ne I've never seen a bunny jump that high. <laughs> maybe Peter rabbit. Yes, <laughs> depends on how hungry they are. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I'm just well, Caitlin, this. this will be recorded then and available on our site. And thank you so much. Great presentation. I can tell you took care in putting it together. Well, thanks, Kitty, for hosting me and happy planting, everyone. I don't know if it'll be a fantastic week for it, but I do hope you get something in the ground. All right, everyone have a great day. Thank you for tuning in.